Good evening. Welcome back to Shop Talk. After a brief one-week hiatus, I was able to wrangle everybody for tonight's episode. So, directly to one of my directions, we have Mala. Mala, say hello. Hello, everybody. How are you? Fantastic. Everybody is fantastic. Uh, next, directly to my southeast we have tracy vagiano hello tracy hello everyone <laughs> and finally indirectly somewhere in my general proximity tom norman hello everyone good evening all right everybody's high energy yes yes and the question <laughs> of whether i'm refreshed i am definitely refreshed i spent several days hiding from people and you can tell. <laughs> so we've got a nice agenda for tonight's episode of Shop Talk. Uh, we are going to start off by talking with Tom about some fun with Kerberos. So yeah, so I came up with an error message this past week, and we actually had a um, domain admin running the Kerberos uh, configuration manager. And when we were running it, we were running into the uh, an error message called invalid namespace. And it had to do something with the SQL uh, WMI. Has anybody been able, first of all, anybody had that issue? And it's running locally. I don't put in the database name, or if I do put in the database name, it doesn't matter. I still get the same error. Um, anybody else have that error? And how did you solve it? Yeah, that's that's uh, not one that I've run into. I did some quick searching, and closest I could come up with was um, versions of SQL Server that had been uninstalled. Uh, <laughs> Anders says reboot. Reboot, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Format and reinstall. Uh, reinstall is even worse, you know. Reformat, reboot, then reinstall. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Burn, cool. burn down the data center. It was uh, it was built on a burial ground. Just I guess kidding. I'm the, I guess I'm the only one. We'll have to kind of see where this goes. More to follow. Yeah, have you, more have to you, follow. Are you using the uh, the DBA tools to just set your SPNs? Uh, yeah, I haven't tried the DBA tools to set the SPNs. That will probably be next. I was just trying to use the new Kerberos configuration manager to do it, and it's not behaving very well. So yeah, I have used the tool before, and it does work. I can testify that it does work, but, <laughs> but DBA tools does have the ability to do it as well. I don't know if you would run into the same error or not. All right, cool. I'll check them out also. Yeah, yeah, or just straight up set SPN. Oh right. yeah, that too. Which I'm sure DBA can... Tools is probably doing something similar under the covers. Yeah. Yep. All right. So Tom will give us an update as he learns more. Yes, sir. Let's see if I can solve the issue. So, next, I got a email from uh, uh, Deepak a little while ago that was let me summarize it it was about uh taking a labeled data set and there you have a binary classification so yes this thing will happen no this thing won't happen and the th the problem is that the number of yeses is a lot smaller than the number of no's so let's say a hundred thousand input records but maybe only a thousand of them actually have a yes and the other 99,000 are no. And the question is, how do you deal with this kind of extremely imbalanced data? And you know, there's a few options. You can filter out the data of the, uh, the yeses and nos and try to get to rough equivalents. So you could say, all right, we've got a thousand yeses, we're gonna take a thousand nos, and then that way we'll have approximate balance. That's one option. Uh, it's not an option I'm generally a huge fan of because usually in these imbalanced scenarios, 
you have a very, very small number of cases in one situation and a huge number in the other. So if you limited it to like the same size, that size ends up being not significant enough for you to really analyze well. This leads to the opposite angle, which is oversampling. So what I described first was undersampling, where I'm going to throw away a bunch of data from one, from the larger case and keep all the data from the smaller case and some of the data from the larger case. The other side is oversampling. Oversampling is where I'm going to have, say it's like 99 to one. I'm gonna take the 1000 records and I'll make 99 copies of them. That way they show up 99 times. You can get a little uh, complexity with this by doing things like taking features among the thousand and in your copies, you can take averages and apply averages. You can apply arbitrarily among those features. So if I have uh, the classifiers, yes, the label is a yes, and I have six features, I might arbitrarily choose values among those six features and apply them. And uh, that's, that's oversampling. So what we're doing in either of those cases is simply taking the two sides and ensuring that they are approximately equivalent in, in terms of counts so that your model doesn't uh, by default land on just choosing one case. You know, the extreme is, look, if I'm gonna be right 99% of the time by saying no, I'm just gonna say no all the time and be right 99% of the time. Now in chat, some really good answers. Uh, actually, the second point I wanted to bring up is exactly what the Duke mentions, XGBoost. So uh, gradient descent in decision trees, boosted decision trees. This is a great technique for dealing with data that is highly uh, imbalanced because of the way that the training works. I'm not gonna get into the details of that here, unfortunately, but I will drop some links in. So I'll drop a link in on chat about how XGBoost works. And for the show notes later on, we're going to cover, uh, I'll cover that as well. In addition to XGBoost, I have my favorite classifier algorithm. So uh, admittedly, it's my favorite because of the name, but it's also my favorite because it works. It's called online passive aggressive algorithms. Technically, it's how I deal with Twitter. Uh, in practice, the concept here is that for a binary classifier, uh, it's online because it doesn't really care about history. So it only cares about the current value. And if it predicts the current value correctly, it is passive, no changes happen. If it does not predict that value correctly, it is aggressive. It will change as many weights as it needs to, to get to the point where it would have been correct. And then it moves on. So there are ways that you can mess with the system. Like if you have data that's skewed in a particular fashion, you can really get a bad result. But when you're dealing with fairly well randomized data, you end up with a really quite good classifier that can be trained online because it's essentially uh, a memory free model. It doesn't care about what the, the history was, how it got to this point, only cares about the input that you feed it and is really fast to predict. Now the downside is that the set of weights in a scenario where we built out ended up being enormous, as in the data size, the weight size was about 10x what an equivalent neural network looked like. And as a result, we ended up switching from passive aggressive to a neural network. But it handles uh, class imbalance really well too because of its uh, memory free properties. As long as you have enough cases that it can learn, then you don't have to oversample because uh, the, the concept is that, well, it would be right every time you feed it that same input data. So Kevin. Yes. Question for you. Let's back up and say exactly what we're trying to 
solve with this so that people kind of understand are we talking about machine learning what are we what that's are we what I, that, that's what i want to know too, yeah. what are we trying to for for those of us that are uh not quite where you are what, mm -hmm. what, what, what exactly are we trying to solve here so that was sentence three of breath one uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can just break down my the entire show by, well, that was breath number six. Oh, 20 minutes into the episode. Okay. The, um, I'll answer that. The Duke mentions neural network passive aggressive classifiers. I have not seen those. That must be fairly recent. I know that there's a fair amount of work that's gone in over the past few years of a neural network. So of passive aggressive, and I would not be shocked to see neural networks tied in. So Okay, I'll give you a concrete example. I want to predict whether or not an employee will leave my company. I work for a mega corp that has tens of thousands of customers or tens of thousands of employees. And we want to figure out uh, which employees are going to leave. Now, you're not going to have a huge percentage of employee churn, hopefully, you know, like like Anthony mentions. Uh, hopefully, you have a fairly small percentage of employees who churn. So let's say it's 1% or 2%. That may be a little hopeful, but we'll go with that. Well, when you have only 1% or 2% of employees who churn, a simplistic model is simply to say, oh, just assume that nobody ever churns, and then you're 98 99% right. And you say, oh, I have this model, it's 99% correct, which looks great until you realize that it predicts 0% of the people who actually do churn. So that's a pretty terrible model. And as part of why accuracy with imbalanced classes is not the measure you want to look for. Instead, you want to look at positive and negative predictive value. So we're looking at Okay, person left, did I predict that they were that they would leave? Person stayed, did I predict the person would stay? And Anthony is like filling in every, as I say it, also typing it in, which is wonderful because uh, that is good to see. So thank you. Thank you for continuing to type that stuff in. It's like, I'm, I'm not just making this up, I promise. Um, so, so Anders wants to know more, how he can have so more churn in his employees, and that's pretty easy. If you if you need a seminar, we can. Uh, Tracy's got plenty of stories about how to how to make employees leave. <laughs> it starts Sorry. with bad management. Just how to make me leave. <laughs> so do I. Yeah, I've got plenty too. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking oh. about data science, data analytics type of trying to figure out and predict where people, uh, what what a scenario is going to do. Yeah, yeah, so you're trying to predict that action that somebody will take. Oh boy, please define accuracy for those who don't know sensitivity and specificity. Yes, uh, sorry, I, I will answer, I will answer that. And I mentioned positive and negative predictive value, sensitivity and specificity also important. This all gets into a very uh, fun topic, and I may end up just pulling up a confusion matrix to make life easier for everybody. But yes, you're right, Tom. The gist of it is that we want to try to predict an event, and in this event, you know, you've got cases that are really uncommon, and those are important cases. You know, that's that's actually more important for us to predict than the really common case. So it's not so much, I can predict that 99% of people won't churn, but it's finding that 1% and determining if we want to keep those people, what do we need to do? You know, what are the indicators that somebody is looking like they're going to leave the company? And if we want to keep them, what kinds of things could we do to keep that person there? So that's the gist of the problem. And it gets into the specific answers that you know, I was talking about there around oversampling or undersampling. So Anders asked the question of why would I want to make copies of the data? And part of the answer is that 
in some models, you just want to make sure that you have enough examples in your test in, in your test data set uh, to capture inputs. Now you may want to tweak those data points in your oversampling. So as you make copies of them, you may you may modify some of the inputs within a range. And uh, just to ensure that you actually have enough cases to where the model doesn't simply throw away that class and say, you know what, I can get it right a lot of the time if I just ignore that answer. Which kind of sucks when that's one of only two answers. So going back to chat as I try to pull up a confusion matrix which is a wonderful name because it leaves people confused. So let's see. I was going to say, what? are we already all confused? <laughs> Why don't you use a stacked machine learning approach and treat special cases as special cases? Why try to model low incident events in big data, or do I miss something? Yeah, there's, there's something that's being missed here, and that is the low incident event is the interesting event. In another example, if you have the, the two classic examples... Well, one of the classic examples is actually around disease. You have some disease which is extremely uncommon, but very important to treat. So you want to figure out who in the population has this disease. And you have a test for it. Well, if only 1 in 10,000 people has the disease, a simple test would, could just say, nope, nobody has it, and be right 9,999 times out of 10,000. That test is technically reasonable in the sense that it is right 99.99% of the time. It is, however, utterly useless because the whole point is to find the one person in 10,000 who actually has that disease. So uh, that's why we care about it. Uh, it's, it's not a special case. It's the case we really care about that is just fairly uncommon. So I'm going to share my screen and pop up a little bit on matrices of the confused form. So let's do this thing. Go to full screen. All right. So what we have here is predictions and actual values. And we have a yes no outcome. This is fairly balanced. This is not wildly un imbalanced like my example, but that's cool. Uh, we have no's and yeses. And so we have cases where the model predicted a no and it really was a no. That's good. That's a good outcome. We have cases where the model predicted a yes and it actually was a yes. Also a good outcome. And then we have the two bad outcomes. We predicted Yes, you have this thing, but you really didn't. We predicted, no, you didn't have this thing, but you really did. So those are our four cases, the four possible cases. Uh, what is data school? Data school is a website. It just happened to show up in Google. So we have true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. So in other words, we predicted, yes, you have a disease and you do have the disease. So this is our true positive down here. Our true negative, you don't have the disease, and we thought you didn't have the disease. False positives, we thought you had the disease, but you really didn't. False negatives, we thought you, were, uh, you did not have the disease, but you actually did. Now, given those values, so we have those counts, we can create different formulas to determine correctness. And I purposefully did not use the term accuracy there because as the Duke points out, accuracy has a specific definition in this framework. And that is basically sum up these two corners, divide it by the total number of outputs. So 100 plus 50 over 165. So it's 91% correct, which that's, that's your accuracy. But uh, here's true positive rate. So let me come back up to here. If we said 
that or actually if it is an actual yes so if the person does have the disease how frequently did we predict that you would have the disease 100 out of 105 cases is our true positive rate and that is sensitivity uh, or recall so it depends if you're in the medical world typically you'll see a sensitivity if you're in the documents world typically you'll see it called recall but they both mean the same thing here now a uh, true negative rate if you claimed that we do not have the disease how frequently is it that we do not have the disease so dang nabbit i actually went across um that's the that's the wrong one so true negative rate let me go back again if you really did not have the disease how frequently did you did we predict that you would not have the disease? So here it's 50 out of 60, because there were 60 people who really did not have it. We got 50 of them correct. So that is the true negative rate, also known as specificity. Precision is the true positive over the number predicted. So if we predicted that you had the disease, how frequently were we correct? So that's 10 out of 11, that's 91%. Um, prevalence actually is something that I don't tend to hear very often, but how often, basically how balanced is this? So here 64% of the inputs are yeses, and that means 36% are noes. Um, that's reasonably balanced, I'm not freaking out about that. If it was 99 to one, then we're really imbalanced. And I will drop a link to this in chat because understanding this this uh, confusion matrix makes a lot helps uh, helps understand a lot of what we're what we're talking about here. All right. So this is so this is going to be more along the line if you are in the data science world versus uh, just a normal DBA role or SQL developer role that you're going to probably not use this that frequently? Maybe not. Um, I mean, we can we could make an argument. I could make an argument that database developers and DBA should know a bit more statistics. But yeah, you're much more likely to find this in a data science situation. You won't see many application developers or database developers talking about specificity or sensitivity though again if you you know if, if you're trying to answer a yes no question these types of things are important right all right well and that could also be important if you're trying to do some you know like a power bi report and you're doing graphics and pulling things around and stuff like that this this really helps to try to explain uh to management when you're looking at those type of things they kind of want to know these outliers as you're explaining yes yes and specifically this is for a model that is predicting a value and i'm using right. yes no just as a simplification it doesn't have to be yes or no it can be you can have any two classes you could have multi-class classifiers though then the confusion matrix starts getting a little bit trickier to follow even as soon as you introduce a third possible class yes no and maybe or blue green and red then we end up having to work through the math a little bit more it's obviously not impossible you certainly can still do it but uh, two class is the easiest to think about. It's the easiest to conceptualize. And it's also pretty reasonable. Uh, it happens fairly frequently in the, the world of data science that you need to predict two classes. So it's useful and it's something that we can work with in our heads. Yeah, it is definitely more difficult when explaining and evaluating multi-class classifiers, absolutely. Because then you, you start getting into the comparison of one against all, or is it uh, best guess, and the math around it still doable, but gets more complex. So 
Incidentally, the way Shop Talk works, because I didn't mention this at the front, at the top of the hour, is we are looking for your questions, your thoughts, your comments. That drives the show. I have an agenda. Frankly, if I don't get to a single point on my agenda by the end of the hour, that's still okay. The agenda is just here so that we don't sit there stammering for an hour trying to make up content. Because I'm really, really bad at that. That's why I have an agenda. So in the meantime, if there are any questions, please feel free to drop them in chat and we'll hit them. And it looks like there is a question. How do you manage, like plan or schedule a seminar? So, all right, You're pr not, not the seminar itself. So Tom, Tracy, both of you do a lot of presenting or have done a lot of presenting, perhaps will do a lot of presenting. How do you keep track of where you're going, when you're going, what you're presenting? Outlook. Oh. Yep, yeah, mine is basically, you know, Google Mail and Google Google Calendar. Uh, the nice thing is, is that if you are staying within PASS's organization, you can look on their website mm -hmm. to, to see what you're doing and stuff. But if you're speaking to multiple uh, platforms, you know, data grilling, you know, you name, you know, you name all the rest of them, then yeah, you're going to need a calendar or something to kind of keep up, keep up with it. Um, one of the nice parts about it is, is, is a lot of your sessions, you present them multiple times. You do not present them just once. So, you know, um, like I've been presenting encryption for over a year and a half. So right. I can almost, I almost present that one, you know, blindfolded. So. Okay. So Anders mentions just randomly showing up and starting to talk, which is true. I've never had him on the Raleigh schedule and yet somehow he just shows up in a room and. <laughs> Have any of you ever presented the wrong talk? So I'll give, um, I'll give my answer to the last question while Tom and Tracy think about, have you ever presented the wrong talk? Um, my answer is that I keep track of a lot of things similar to Tom in Google Calendar. Um, I have a Google spreadsheet just so that I can access it on the road. Otherwise I would use Excel because Excel is way better than Google Sheets. No controversy here, it's just straight up better. But for tracking presentations, basically it'll be the event, the date, the talk or talks that I'm giving, the URL so that I can keep track of that later, the count of attendees, and I started tracking whether it was a webinar because uh, at the time I didn't do webinars very frequently. So I didn't want to accidentally think, oh my gosh, I have to go to this place and remember that, oh yeah, it's online. So have any of you ever started presenting the wrong talk? Can't say no. that I have. I've Can't. always had them in my calendar and labeled as to what talk they were started prepping the week ahead of time to make sure everything worked, even though I've presented it maybe even the week before. So. So I, I can I have a funny story here. Um, and a certain celebrity speaker who shall remain unnamed at the summit, um, he had the wrong slide deck on him and he was about 20 minutes into his presentation before he realized that what was on the screen was not what he was talking about. It was something. Oh. Was, oh. <laughs> he so always make sure that what you what you have on on the screen is what you're going to talk about. And the people in the audience were trying to get his attention and tell him until somebody actually went up and said, "That's not what you're talking about." He never got it, and he was about twenty twenty five minutes into it. So. Uh, <laughs> that's. The worst thing that ever happened to me, though, was at SQL Saturday Raleigh last last time, and that is, my laptop actually connected to the video, uh, the the projector in the vendor room, and I was projecting, and I went to the classroom to present my session, and the laptop would not connect, no matter what I did. Mm. So I so I actually ended up having to present on the whiteboard. And I pulled off my entire presentation, presenting it on the whiteboard. So, yeah, I've so I've never um, 
had that experience because I'm paranoid about what I'm presenting. Now I do also double check that the slide version that I've got is actually the correct version because especially if you have to deal with PowerPoint slides for uh, certain events like Pass Summit, I wanna make sure I've got the version instead of a prior version that I've saved because correct. when you get to that to-do slide that's like, fill out the rest of this. <sighs> Not great. But, okay. Nope. Uh, Jeff asks, does anyone have any cool ways to compare multiple databases where the expectation is that the schema should be the same, but you're expecting that there will be drift? The SQL package and SSDT and Redgate SQL compare do exist, but does anyone have knowledge of a turnkey solution? There's the problem. To generate a report for a few dozen instances. Oh my. Um, yeah, I would I would definitely tell you to use SQL Compare or Visual Studio to do the comparison. Um, Tracy, does DBA Tools have anything like that? Have you heard of anything that you're aware of? I think they do, but they're but he's trying to do dozens all at the same time, isn't he? Instead of just doing comparing two. So he looked at DBA tools, didn't see it. Yeah, Jeff, is this is this gonna be compare against some canonically correct version? Or is this uh hodgepodge? So he has a master database. Does the master database is it actually correct or is that like um <laughs> complete bucket correct? Well, then Redgate has a command line that you can use and yes. automate that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know that does. I don't know about any of the other ones that if they do or not, but I've used it. I think Apex SQL had one too, although I don't recall using it, a uh, data compare thing. They do have a schema comparison. Uh, Apex had a command right. line. You can do um, with Redgate, they have command line. They also have .NET objects. And a few years back, I played with that. The problem that I had was that when you start getting into a lot of changes, then it gets slow and it's really messy to discern. Here's, here's a listing of all the changes. It got really bad. Um, but I don't know of anything that's turnkey that's going to be here is my master schema. Here's my list of all the places that should look exactly like it. Give me no, something. No, I did, I did has one too. I'm not used to it, uh, but there is. I know that it exists. There's yeah. a there's a website, and Kevin, I'll put it up here. That basically is giving like 20 different tools that can do a comparison uh, between them. So maybe there's something there for it, but. You know, my honest opinion is the best one I know of is uh, Redgate. Yes. Okay. And that's Fully easy, agree. Yes. And that's easy right. to do. And yes. with all of them, it's not so much a one-to-one -one comparison. It's more of the one to 40. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the only hassle I had with the Redgate thing was when it tried to sync the differences, I would not use it to do that. But otherwise, just to get a report, it's totally fine. Correct. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, what makes it a challenge to use something like a Redgate tool is if you're going between environments, uh, meaning you're going between, say, QA and UAT, and you actually have a different security schema sitting there, and you're you're wanting to also compare the the security. So that you know that would definitely put a challenge there, uh, but overall, yeah, Groups. it's Just a great don't compare UI. <laughs> yeah, don't. You're right. Don't compare the logins. Yeah, don't mm -hmm. compare the okay. logins in the. Just in use the, groups. Yes. Yeah. You can you you know if you set up your security right, you can definitely compare your um, database roles. But of course, you had different accounts in those database roles depending upon the environment. We we don't care about security, but not in the way that that sounds. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I think. 
But if you want to share that out to the group that I sent you, basically yep. there's a there's like 20 different tools that will do exactly what you're asking. So already launched it into chat. <laughs> so let's take a moment and go to Mala's book corner. My what books this for week? this week, I have two of them. Uh oh, I only have one on my list. Sorry. There's a bonus book, open. everybody. Pardon? This is a bonus book. I always do too, I thought. Hmm. Well, this is only the okay. second time we've done it, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Okay, so this one is called Observe, Collect, Draw. It's, um, it's a way for people who are not very good with visualization to learn a bit of it. Um, I personally believe, just like Kevin said about statistics, I personally believe that we have to, everybody has to know a certain amount of basic visualization. Uh, regard, we don't have to be experts at it, but we have to know how to read simple charts and you know draw some interpretation and maybe even do our own if we have a need to do it. So this is uh, two, uh, two uh, people who were pen, pen pals across the pond. Uh, one person is from here, from the US, and the other is from Italy. They started writing to each other, and they started using visualizations to communicate instead of uh, the usual uh, handwritten letters. And they made a book out of it. Um, and following the book, they made a journal, which is for other people to practice. And they are on Twitter, hashtag Dear Data, if you want to follow. Uh, they're a nice hashtag to follow. And this is an, a journal that you can do like maybe at your own pace to draw some basic charts and how you would read data that does not have you know, numbers and words associated with it necessarily. What interpretation would you draw out of it? And I am about halfway into it and I find it fascinating. I find it very interesting to learn, learn it that way. There are multiple ways to learn how to do simple visualizations, but this is a way I really like. So that is book number one, and uh, that I highly recommend. The second one is um, a book on architecture. It's called Vertically Integrated Architectures, and the author is one J-O-S, Joss Young, J-O-N-G. I hope I'm saying his name right, but that's his name. Um, it's a small book. It is something you can read page to page, not like a very bulky tech book that you can only use for reference. Um, it, in my opinion, all books should be around things like this that you can read and you know maybe keep around you, but uh, you can read it. And what this author is doing is he is looking into ways we architecture applications today. He starts with history of databases and uh, 4GLs and how we didn't do very well with uh, in-memory databases and things that did not work out. So he's building a premise to say that just because we are in technology doesn't mean we cannot take a step backwards and go back into doing things uh, a certain way because newer ways do not work. So that's the initial few chapters is building that argument on things that we tried and did not work. And among them are 4GLs and object-oriented databases. And then he has another uh, little bit about how hard it is to find good technical folks which to me, it was a bit of a diversion, but it was, you know, everybody knows that good technical uh, talent is hard to find. And he combines both and he starts to uh, make an argument for an architecture that is not necessarily a layered approach. So he tries to uh, talk around some myths in the current uh, world. And according to him, he says big monolithic systems are bad and unmanageable is not necessarily true and such. And he starts getting into um, into this area, but I'm halfway through it. And he starts building an argument for a vertically integrated architecture. That is, um, that is a data model that is um, that serves as the database schema, the programming data model, and the client side data model. And you use implicit services as a generic API to communicate. Um, I'm not sure what is the kind of technologies he wants to use to achieve this end, but so far it's been a really interesting read. And I really recommend, maybe we can even discuss this book if multiple of us want to read it um, on another hour. So those are the two books for today. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, links are in chat for both of those. They'll also show up in the show notes. So I want to hit two questions that came up during Data Architecture Day that are related and bulky questions. Um, I was joking before stream that this is this is the bomb throwing segment of the hour. <laughs> so from Mr. Lysanke from earlier on, how does the process of database design change if we tell you that you'll be working with a group or groups of programmers who will want to store and retrieve data efficiently from the database for their tasks, but they don't know yet what they're going to be storing and that target's going to be changing through the development life cycle. So could I create some sort of database schema and structure and access procedures that help the team and won't be completely inefficient with a constantly evolving data design? And the other side is from the Duke, do we have any tips for balancing normalization with development speed? And I think that those two problems are very closely coupled. Um, or at least that they, they have similar answers that overlap and that this is going to be an opportunity for us to have a Jerry Springer moment where like Tracy comes at us with a folding chair. <laughs> Why me? Well, Why you? Because you were the first person I looked at. Well, I'm, it's, I'm not like my parents. It's interesting that I just came off of a, a major project that that had this very scenario we had we were moving very rapidly in an agile uh environment and we actually had it got up to where i had four different teams accessing and doing different things with the database so things were evolving and changing very quickly um you <laughs> you basically have to uh put your best foot forward on the understanding of what the specification and feature functionality uh, that they're trying to accomplish and put it out there. And then you're likely, not likely, you're going to modify it. You're going to change it. It's going to, you're going to find something out new or they didn't tell you something uh, didn't tell the developer something and, and almost like shoehorned it in later on. And you're like going, if you would have just told me that part of it, the database di design might have been just a little bit different than what it is. Yeah. So, and we're dealing with microservices. So, you know, they were all microservices, all APIs hitting the database and stuff. So it was a lot of fun. And it all worked out in the end. So the database design is still fairly solid. OK. Any other thoughts before I go on my build up to a rant? Want to hear your rant, Kevin. Yeah, you probably away. cover what, what the rest of us want to say. Yeah. Much more efficiently, probably. So actually, I don't think I really have a rant for this, but I did put put some time into thinking about it because um, the first thing that I was thinking about actually was a story from Phil Factor. And I love Phil's stories. So this is from quite a while ago about uh, entity attribute value and how this ends up being the idea that most so many developers land on as like, I have solved all of the problems of database development. It was so easy until you actually try to implement it. Uh, then it all falls apart. That said, if we're talking about a prototype, and here's my quasi rant, companies don't prototype anymore. If it's good enough for development, it's good enough for production. Um, and if, if it barely works in development, ship it. Um, but, oh, actually, you know, I, that, I even used that line in my, in my notes here. That's pretty funny. But uh, also, we'll fix it in round two is a comforting lie that we tell ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I 
there is no round two. <laughs> there is no yes. next next Later. iteration. Yes. Uh, yes. It seems like there's never time for that because now we have to go work on another prototype that's thrown out into production and handling the the fallout from that. But getting some of the cynicism, putting some of that aside, if we are talking about a proper prototype where it's extremely early on in development, we have no idea what we're doing, then EAV combined with uh, using stored procedures as interfaces can give you some of some of that flexibility without being a killer, as long as you realize that thing's gonna fall apart as soon as you get into production. Um, the Duke mentions, in this data lake distributed era, it's like we don't even wait to get into a well thought out data warehouse. Wait, what's a what's a thought out data warehouse? What do you mean I have to create a bus <laughs> diagram? Um, yeah, that's absolutely right, and it's it's sad but true. So, th walking through some of this, there is going to be planning involved. Databases are stateful things. We can't just throw it away and say, oh, you know, I can trash this container and start up a new container and everything's going to be exactly how I want it to be. There's a lot of planning and prep work that goes into getting to that point. And there are some techniques that you can use to try to bootstrap your way through a little bit. Uh, one of them, as Anthony points out, is using a technology like maybe a MongoDB or Cosmos DB or DynamoDB or some uh, key value style or document style structure, either one of those. And that can be fine for early development, just trying to get things out. Although there is some cost that if you're gonna switch that to a relational model later on, uh, that's possibly quite a bit of rework involved. Um, there are risks of using one database platform for that early development and another database platform for production. And there's that cost of translation that you know, you're introducing, probably you're introducing bugs at some point in there. Uh, if you go to production with the thing, okay, that's fair. You know, if you have a use case that says, this is the right data platform technology, cool. Um, if the plan is, I'm gonna take it someplace else, it can work early on. Same thing with EAV. It can work early on, and is if if you take the effort, you take the time, you realize that there will be translation issues that, to work out. It's possible. It's doable. Um, you could go interface first. EAV means entity attribute value, and the idea here is imagine a relational database table with three columns a string for the entity, a string for the attribute, a string for the value. And so for user Bob, Bob has a cat named Fluffy. So then it would be Bob cat Fluffy. Bob has a dog named Poochie. Bob dog Poochie. Bob has a height of 164 centimeters. Bob height 164, which would be saved as a string because, you know, it's nasty. Um, and then it comes time to parse through this and try to figure out for this screen, we're going to show all of Bob's pets. So now we're, uh, searching in here for the type, the attribute of pet or cat or dog or whatever. Don't even get me started on SQL variant, Solomon. SQL variant is of the devil. Um, it is, that is just a trap. So... You store it that way, and then you can read it, you can filter, it's gonna be slow. It's okay for development where you have 20 rows. It's awful for production because it does not uh, span. It, does not, it doesn't scale at all. Um, Solomon has mentioned he's just mentioning it, not advocating SQL variant. I saw the, the ellipsis, I know it was more of trolling. You're trolling, and that's okay. I, I'm okay with people trolling. Um, so ultimately you could do interface first, 
even think of like a memory only local database database where it's just you're storing objects as part of building up your test suite and it's not really saving the data anywhere but you're getting to the point where okay i i'm comfortable enough that the code is stable now i can start talking to the database people to actually translate and make modifications so this is incredibly simplistic you know like just think of i have a bunch of objects and then this is how my app will work. I'll need an object that looks like this, an object that looks like this, an object that looks like this. And then as we change all of these things, um, obviously that's that's fairly easy to change. It's a few, it's hopefully just a few lines of code and some unit tests, some integration tests. Then as it stabilizes, now you can bring in the database people. Now we can say, okay, well in the relational model, those objects work like this. Here's how they connect together. Here's how we're going to store it in a relational model. And let me build you some stored procedures that give you back the objects you're expecting. Using those stored procedures as an interface layer to soften the blow for the developers and to keep uh, your relational system appropriately normalized. Um, Jeff mentions something I would suggest and Kevin is alluding to is to make sure you have interfaces or a data access layer so that the business logic doesn't have to understand the deep integration of the data. Doesn't need to be infinitely flexible, but makes it a lot easier if you have this planned out rather than trying to figure out how to migrate from one data store to another. Absolutely. Yeah, I mentioned stored procedures as that interface. Above that, yeah, data access layer to where you could, you could conceivably swap out. Um, the number of cases where I see actual data platform swap outs are practically nil. It's incredibly uncommon, but you know it does it does happen sometimes. Um, not I, I've seen I've seen data swap outs or models like changing the database under the covers. It's just not incredibly frequent. So my ultimate answer, you just do your best to do the right work each time because I don't think there are shortcuts to this. I think that as um, we're working on something that is stateful where it's, you know, the, going back to earlier on in the episode, I talked about online passive aggressive algorithms don't really have a memory. They don't care about what happened before. Relational databases absolutely have this memory. We, it matters how you got to that point in terms of how you can move forward. It's really difficult to move forward when you've painted yourself into a corner and found out that, oh, all of these assumptions that I've been making about the, the data model have been wrong or they've been incomplete. And instead of just trying to piecemeal fit things in, um, it's important that you realize that there will be time that or will be times when we just have to stop, take the time, update things, get things right. And frankly, if your data model is rapidly changing constantly, you're not ready to create anything yet. You know, you're not ready to create tables and columns and tie things together. That's a much more stable like later in the process of development because until that point, you don't really need a database. You need to come up with a data model. And if you're rapidly evolving, that's not a data model. That's just that's just uh, PMs trying to come up with a solution. It's not a knock on the PMs. It's just, you know, basically it's not a mature enough idea yet. So it ties in. How do you balance normalization with development speed? So we're not talking about application performance. Uh, that's a little bit of a different story, but I want to follow rules of normalization. I wanna follow good practices in transactional processing for a transactional system, but I also want to make sure that you know we can develop, that we can get things done in a sprint. Thoughts on that as I drink my water?
sprint I'm not sprout. sure I understand uh, the relationship between speed as speed as it pertains to our spent on work and normalization necessarily or is that um, are, are they referring to is the question around how long a, no, a really deeply normalized uh, database uh, querying is going to take or how long is it going to take to actually normalize the data out so i can see this from two different angles um angle one is there's an existing system, perhaps it wasn't that well planned out, and uh -huh. you have two choices. You can either add this new column or these two new columns, or restructure the data model, break things out into several tables, and you know, f uh, fix possible data modification issues, the things that we do because of normal forms, um, but that's a lot more work. And it has probably, it's gonna have upstream ramif ramifications with the application because now you're changing multiple tables. Maybe you're breaking things out, you're turning things from uh, one wide table into a few narrower tables that maybe some are one to many now instead of being copied within rows. So, when the other alternative is, well, I can just slap another column on there and call it a day. Uh -huh. Or you can slap the person that wants to do that and <laughs> tell them, that, you know, <laughs> let's, let, let's do it right. You know, it, it's uh, a lot of that is <laughs> too, Kevin, is when you're going through it rapidly, is just having the experience to kind of know that. You know, if you are going to be dealing with, for example, storing emails, mm -hmm. well, then you pretty much know that um, you're going to be storing it normally for some individual normally or some location. And then you're also going to be storing a type. Is it my work? Is it my home? Is it, you know, uh, you know, is it my you know, pleasure, you know, whatever other type of emails you might have. So it's kind of understanding too what you're trying to build up there and, and understanding the concepts of looking at how does that thing work today out in the world? Because uh, most of us are not building something that you've never seen before. You've never, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're, building something you've normally dealt with. So I've run into some of this with the amount of lookups that we have to do with some of the data we have at work. And uh, developers oftentimes want to take shortcuts and just go say, one means this, two means this, three means this. So there's no need to keep that information anywhere. I'm just going to create a table with a small int and say one, and I know what it means. And you know, tomorrow that guy is gone and afterwards somebody is looking at that data and wondering what is this one here and they have no idea what it means. So um, things well, like that. So one of the arguments I've been able to make with some degree of success and because this actually happened with a couple of people leaving is that the trade off between who's going to maintain that data and who's going to figure out what all that really means. So if you normalize it, assuming that it's more than a certain number of values and you put it in a certain table, then you have a better chance of knowing what that data means, even if all the people who made that thing are gone. Yeah, and that's the thing that, that, when, yeah, that when we built our application, you know, I was really forceful in saying, okay, I wanted, you know, some people want a huge lookup table with all the different values in there. And I was like going, oh, no, no, no. I want a foreign key against that table. So right. I'm going to so create an enum table for you, even though SQL Server doesn't do real well with it. And I will, you know, you tell me the values, I will make sure it's not going to be an identity column, but I will insert the one, two, three, and we'll put the word and tell, tell us what that item happens to be. So yeah, so you so you just have to turn around and and uh, make a point there. It's one yeah. of the battles I did win when I was working <laughs> with it. 
So the Duke mentions that due to politics in the Data Lake world, you typically only have the choice of slap the extra column in there. But when you start talking about relational database systems, you really have to take that time and make those t changes to the tables, to the procedures, try to get things right. And um, I, co I completely agree with that. Basically, my thought is, in the ideal world, you have this data model planned out, and you know, that data model differs from the applications model. It's it's not the same. You have the relational data model, and that data model is gonna survive the application. There will be three, four, five versions of that app before that database goes away. So everybody knows the rules. We all know how it all works. In reality, we expect changes. We rework when we have to. Um, and we, it makes sense to build in that time that, okay, we're adding in this new thing, but we're hitting a table that is troublesome. And here's why. And um, if it just comes down to it, we may have to, for a while, have two designs in mind. You have the existing model and you have the idealized model. And keeping those in sync and saying, I want to whenever I can get closer to this ideal model. Um, if I can't make the argument that we need to get to this ideal model now, at least I can try to trend toward that model um, and try to fix things as soon as we can. I mean, if it's possible, you know, take that extra time, get it right if you can, even if you can't fix everything, fixing some of it, getting closer to that ideal, is a net benefit in the end. And I think a lot of developers, so Mike mentions that you know developers are like everybody else. They, they don't like change more than anybody else does. They have to deal with it. And there is that factor. But you know, I think also on the other side, developers still wanna get things right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a trade-off admittedly, but you know, point of professional pride that, hey, I wanna go home knowing that I did the best that I could here. And I don't think that many developers uh, last long in the business if they just, like, I want to get the minimum amount of stuff done and uh, call it a day. There, those people do exist. But I think a lot of developers uh, do actually want to try and may not necessarily know here is the, here is the reasoning, here is the understanding of it. So again, going back, using stored procedures as an interface because now data model separate from application model, I can make a lot of changes to the application model, or excuse me, to the data model without having to change that application side. Unless they use entity framework. Unless they use entity <laughs> framework, then, then it's a garbage dump. It's a, it's a garbage fire. Uh, last question of the night because we do have to wrap up. Can SQL Server allow a database to work down two paths, which may make something out of sync, but able to compensate for changes? I actually don't know what that means. What sounds, that? Like, sounds like they want to update the database from two different websites coming in two different angles. Um, you know, you would have to do some type of merge replication or something like that if you were going to turn around and and have two different areas, like maybe a mobile hitting it versus a website hitting it. Uh, you're going to end up with some type of merge replication uh, that you have to deal with, merge conflicts and everything else. So not going to get easy. That's what it sounds like. It's a patch in the database for function, but then we use an update to deal. So having i guess argue i guess you could say like hey i have two different functions two different or two different procedures and i don't know if you're a b testing for example and you want to see if this thing works four percent of the time i'll call this version 96 percent of the time i'll call this version make sure that things work and yes but that would be application code determining it or or you have you have an outer procedure that like checks a uh, rand value and if it's lower than this number call procedure a otherwise call procedure b if you're doing this you're it's a little crazy but um possible it's something you would develop yourself within sql server 
or two storage tables or formats. So one procedure that writes to two tables. Yes, that's easy. Uh, that you can have one procedure write to two tables, different styles. If you have say old table, new table, that's a good way to keep those in sync while you're propagating data out from the old table to the new and eventually switching over. Yeah, that's a common pattern. And final, final question. Anthony asks, ready for predictive analytics world? I am as ready as I am going to be. Uh, predictive analytics world actually has started today. Tomorrow and Wednesday are the regular session details. Uh, Anthony is one of the presenters at predictive analytics world. So if you've paid to uh, attend, you can go check out his session. There are actually four people from the RTP area who are, who are presenting at that event. Awesome. Will there be recordings, Kevin? It's a paid uh, oh, uh, okay. conference. So I pro maybe, but you have to buy, buy a ticket. Yeah. And it is pricey, yes. Um, so with that, I think we're going to call it a night. Thanks, Mala, everybody. Tom, All Tracy, right. thank you so much for dropping in today. Chat. Much appreciated, much obliged. Keep those questions coming, and we will catch you again next week. Good night. Bye. Good night.